Hello everyone, so this is GS Mains Paper 1, October 2017, Part 3, and this is the last part. Fine, so let's start. So we have done up until 8 topics, this is the 9th topic. 9th topic is Section 295A of IPC and Religious Sentiments, right? And this particular topic is related to Topic 6 of uh, GS Paper 1, that is Indian Society, or Features of Indian Society, and Topic 2, Modern India, we'll see how. See, the thing is, what is happening right now, ban on book, strikes see generally whenever government ban any book so in the past government has banned book of salman rosbi taslima nasreen was under fire right so the thing is ban on book strike and the principle of justice that are mean to fortify our democracy and what happens section 95 of crpc that is criminal procedure code it allows state to forfeit and sub uh, suspend publications that it deems to be in violation of certain provision of IPC such as section 295A of IPC which criminalizes speech that hurts religious sentiments. So are you understanding what is happening? So by using these two particular, uh, what, what do you say, specifics or codes like section 95 of CRPC which and section 295A of IPC, what they are doing? Government is banning books, right? And now we are even seeing how they are banning or how they are trying to ban movies and other things, right? So that is the whole thing. So I will reiterate it again. What is happening? Section 95 of CRPC is allowing state to forfeit and suspend publications that it deems to be in violation of certain provision of IPC, such as Section 295A of IPC, which criminalizes speech that hurts religious sentiments. So what is happening? Both Section 95 of CRPC and 295A of IPC are remnants of India's colonial past and it ought to really have no place in a modern liberal dem democracy like ours. So there should be a provision to repeal both these sections, right? Because they are used as a tool to harass authors as well as to harass filmmakers and nothing else. So remember, again, uh, UPSC will not go that into detail in prelims, but there is a probability, there is a 1%, 2% probability that even they can ask you section 295 of IPC is related to what, you never know, right? So this particular, uh, what do you say, prohibition of this particular IPC or section of IPC is in use. So do uh, remember about it that it talks about what. You don't need to remember each and every intricacies, just get a hold of that, yeah, section 295 of IPC deals with religious sentiments, right? So that is the whole thing. And which particular portion of CRPC can invoke it? Section 95 of, section, sorry, section 95 of CRPC can invoke it, right? So that is the whole thing. So let's move on to the next topic. So the next topic is, uh, do all women have a right to enter Sabri Mala, right? And this is again under topic 7, women related issues. There were three views on it. Now, see the thing is, when you will read this particular topic or the heading, so you will feel that most of the views will be in favor of women's right to enter Sabri Mala. But that is the beauty of the Hindu, because Hindu has given this particular article. And that is the beauty of Hindu. When you will read Hindu, you will realize that there are three views and two views will be saying that woman does not have a right or woman should not be entering Sabri Mala, right? And one view will be telling that woman has rights to enter Sabri Mala and Sabri Mala and there's a, it is derogatory that we are on the, on the basis of sex, we are not allowing woman, right? So that is the beauty. Now you will be getting more points to, what do you say, to write in against of this particular topic, right? Lots of people can write in favor of it, but after you read this article from Hindu or you listen to these things, so you will realize that there are many points in against of it also, right? So, so let's discuss all those things. So there are three views. Let's talk about the first view. So the first view is saying that prohibition of women's entry to the shrine solely on the basis of woman, uh, womanhood is derogatory, right? And it is an irrational and obsolete notion of purity. And this particular thing, what, what Sabri Mala talks about, Sabri Mala temple is all about purity. We'll talk about what Sabri Mala temples, like what, what uh, do people preach in Sabri Mala temples and what happens in Sabri Mala temples. So there's a no notion of purity. So the first view is saying that irrational and obsolete notion of purity clearly offends the equality clauses. That is article 15 clause 1 of constitution and it also curtails women's religious freedom assured by article 25 clause A and they are also saying the first view is saying that in independent India religious reform has predominantly been a judicial task so there is a reason for optimism because in Supreme Court this whole Sabri Mala issue is going on so that's why they are saying that generally whenever such reforms have been taken a big measure reforms have been taken which has been taken by judicial your judicial system so there is a reason for optimism now this was the first view which you know that it is saying that this is a derogatory step that women are not allowed now let's talk about the other two views which you will be saying that they will be against this particular point 
So let's start. So secondly, you're saying that Sabri Mala has some unique customs and systems, and uniqueness is the soul of every temple. In Sabri Mala, deity worship, the god who is worshipped, is in the form of Nastik Brahmachari or a celibate. So let us respect the specific nature of the uh, Pratishtha, that is idol, and bow of celibacy associated with idol, as India is the land of pluralism and multiple paths to divine reality. Right. So that's what they are saying. They are saying that the the god who you, who you are worshiping in Sabri Mala, he is a he is a Brahmachari, he is a celibate. So. That's why there are certain restrictions, and it's not like that is the only temple, right? There are multiple and multiple temples in India where women are allowed. So this particular temple has a certain, what do you say, uniqueness to it, which prohibits women, right? Because you are celebrating a brahmachari there, right? So that's why women are not allowed. So that is the second view. Now let's talk about the third view. A third view is saying that this whole issue is akin to or related to or seems like meat eaters using or suing vegetarian restaurants. For discriminating against non-vegetarians by refusing to serve meat, right? So that's what they are saying. It's it's like you are a non-vegetarian. You are going to a vegetarian restaurant, and then you are saying that you are not getting meat to it. So that means there are enough non-veg restaurants available for meat eaters. You can go there. Similarly, there are enough temples available for women where they can go, right? Again, they are saying that today this whole talk is going on, right? Tomorrow, demand can be of stopping Durga Kali worship. Because it legitimizes violence or declaring worship of Sri Lanka as obscene. So again, this third view is also saying that there are certain traits associated with certain things, right? So similarly, Sabri Sabri Mala is associated with celibacy, and we have to respect it, and that's why women of a specific age group are not allowed there, right? So. Again, the third view is saying that, or the third view is concluding by saying that, while standing up up for gender equality, a democracy must uphold more important values. So they are saying that it's it's okay to talk about feminism, but don't talk about feminism all the time, right? We have other things to worry about also, right? So that is the whole thing. So I I guess now you get the whole view of this Sabri Mala issue, right? And you can write all the issue, all the points in favor of it. In favor, you can write a lot of things, right? You have Article 15.1 and 25.1, right? So you can uh, what do you say? Talk about that, and in against. You can talk about the deity or the celibate or what do you say, um, the brahmachari whom we are what do you say, uh, worshiping in that temple, right? Nastik brahmachari, right? So you can talk about all those things. So I hope this particular issue is clear to you. So let's move on to the next topic. So again, uh, there is a case of mandatory digitization. Aadhaar is linked with everything. Aadhaar has become a panacea for all. So again, the issue is whether this mandatory digitization is a boon or ban, whether it is good or bad. I mean, this is related to topic seven, poverty and development issue. We have talked about it earlier. Also, that topic seven is very huge of main GS main paper one, right? So let's talk about this issue. So the thing is, mandatory digitization is causing immense pain and suffering to the poorest uh, and the most marginalized of this country. We have heard about, or we have Hindu was covering the tragic death of 11-year-old girl in Jharkhand in repeated articles, right? So that is the whole thing, and she died because she didn't get enough food. And again, there are lots and lots of conspiracies or putting say different arguments which are coming. Somebody, government is saying that she didn't die because of hunger, other issues. But the thing is, she died. She has died, right? There is no coming back, right? So that is the whole thing. So there is a demand that beneficiaries should have the option to choose a payment mode that is convenient to them. And this particular thing has been ignored, right? There is a compulsion which is going on that you have to have an Aadhaar. But now after this death, situation has improved somewhat, and government is saying that no, it is not. People will not die if they don't have Aadhaar, right? So that thing is going right. But again, so we have to think whether there is there is more concern for administrative administrative convenience rather than right to life, right? Which is getting more convenience or which is getting favorable position, right? Or Which government is preferring more, administrative convenience or right to life? But again, this is a boring as a seesaw kind of a scenario, right? You are saying that if if we if we don't have Aadhaar, right, there will be too many pilferage, right? There will be too many wastage, right? There will be host beneficiaries, right? To remove these things, we are linking it with Aadhaar. But again, if you come, what do you say? For two year old kid, for four year old kid, if you are telling that you need Aadhaar at all cost, and that particular person is not getting food subsidy, then that thing is also not done. So a delicate balance is required, right? So that is the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about certain one-liners. So first thing is marital rape exception. So you must be knowing that in India, marital rape exception is there, and this case is again going on in Supreme Court, right? So the thing is, 2.6 billion women live in countries, including India, where marital rape is not a crime, right? So 2.6 billion are, what do you say, are devoid of their rights, billion women, right? Now exemption to marital rape is retained. 
despite recommendation by Justice Verma Committee. The thing is, government, when you hear about this particular case and what government is saying, government is saying that if you make marital rape, like if you remove the exception for marital rape, it will impinge or it will affect the marriages. So that's what they are saying. I don't know in which stone age we are living, but I don't buy this particular argument of government. I'm not in support of it. I think marital rape exception should go and there should be no exception. Even in marriages, if rapes are happening, it should be condemned and it should be convicted. Those people who are doing it, they should be convicted at all costs, right? So that is the thing. But again, remember in India, marital rape exception is there in IPC. Fine. But again, now we have seen all those things that child marriages and uh, POXO Act. So lots and lots of other issues are also there related to marital rape exception. Do read, do read about it, right? Now let's talk about the second one liner, which is Greater Nagaland or Nagalim, right? Now think this is the demand of NSC and IM, right? And a framework agreement has been uh, reached between Government of India and NSC and IM. What is NSC and IM? National Socialist Council of Nagaland, Isak Mubaya. And there is another one that is NSC and National Socialist Council of Nagaland. Uh, Khaplan, right? So framework agreement is there with uh, NSC and IM and this Greater Nagaland and Nagaland is a demand of NSC and IM. I mean this is fine, this is very nice, this is a topic under topic 9 regionalism. What do you have to understand from Philip's point of view also that they can ask you Greater Nagaland or Nagaland comprises of what particular areas uh, but uh, there is a probability they can ask you. See the thing is it is an integration of Naga inhabited areas of Arunachal Pradesh Assam and Manipur. If you want to look at the greater map of this particular area, na, you can go to IDC, IDSA website and or even if you want to, if you if you're not able to find it in IDSA, what you can do is just write Nagalim and write IDSA on Google and you will find a map which will show you very nicely that it covers part of Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Assam and Manipur. This greater Nagaland or Nagalim area. This is a proposed area. It, it, it has not been, what do you say, this is a demand of theirs, right? So that is the whole thing. Okay, remember it in regionalism. You can talk about all those things, right? Okay, fine. So this was all. We are done with GS mains paper one, right? And now we'll start for November editions, right? We'll start GS paper two. Thank you.